What a glorious way to begin worship. Thank you so much. And I know you can't see the comments happening on Zoom, but also glorious, beautiful, pretty music. People are really enjoying it here and there. So thank you for being here. And now will you join me in the call to worship, either in your bulletin or on your screen? We gather here this morning to worship God. Surely God is in this place and calls us to worship in spirit and truth. God's love is for you and for all people everywhere, that we may share God's love and life and be refreshed in the spirit. For God is surely with us. Let us praise God together. Will you please stand as you are able and join us in our opening hymn number 276, We Gather Together. to the Congregational Church on Mercer Island this beautiful July Sunday morning. Uh, and a special welcome to anybody who may be visiting with us today, either here in person or on Zoom. If you'd like to know more about us and are worshiping in person, I'd love for you to introduce yourself to me, and, as well as fill out a visitor card with your contact information and put it in the offering plate in the back, if you're comfortable with that. And if you're on Zoom, I will put my email address and my cell phone number in the chat and would love to hear from you. If you would like me to contact you, please feel free to enter your contact information in the chat as well. A few announcements. Uh, this Wednesday evening is our third session of our Sacred Conversations series. It's from 7 to 8.30 p.m. And our first two uh, gatherings have been powerful evenings of sharing and of sharing hope for the future. So I ask you to join us, even if you haven't been there um, on the past two Wednesday evenings, please come, we would love to have you. Summer, summer Bible study continues uh, Wednesdays at noon and that is on Zoom as well as in person here. Uh, the Zoom link is at the top of the home page on the website if you'd like that. Coming up on August 6th, we will be having a pet blessing and a community picnic afterwards. And uh, Peggy has put together a sign-up sheet which will be over on the uh, fellowship hour table uh, after worship. And we'd like you to sign up if you're coming. So. Burgers, uh, meat burgers and veggie burgers, condiments and cold beverages will be provided for the picnic, 
but we're asking for folks to bring either a side dish or a dessert. Um, and there's also a, a place to indicate if you are able to help set up or clean up after the event. I think it's gonna be a really fun Sunday full of happy chaos. Mm -hmm. I hope you're all here um, and uh, can come and will help um, by either bringing food or helping setting up and cleaning up. We will need some assistance with this event. We embrace generosity as a spiritual practice here at CCMI, and we're grateful for the ability to share our gifts of time and money for God's transforming work in the world. So if you'd like to give online, you can click the Give Today button on the top of our website, which is ucc-ccmi.org, or you can click on the QR code in your bulletin. If you're here in person and would like to offer cash or a check, there is also an offering plate in the back of the sanctuary. And if you are one of our Zoomers today, looks like there's a fair amount of you, uh, and you have prayer requests, I ask that you submit them in the chat at this time so that I will have a chance to incorporate them into our pastoral prayers later in the service. Are there any other announcements? Anything I've missed? Bob? It's perfectly reasonable. Oh, Bill's coming with the mic. Bob, wait for the mic, okay, so that the people on Zoom will be able to hear. It's perfectly reasonable for every musician to carry their instrument with them. J Jim Miller carries his flute wherever he goes. <laughs> Leslie McMichaels <laughs> takes her harp also, and almost as effortlessly as Jim handles the flute. That's right. That's right. Leslie was with us for a period of time here as our secretary, and we had an opportunity to hear, and it's wonderful for you to come back. And if you are in the parking area when she leaves, watch her do it. She is something. Thank you, Leslie. <laughs> Thanks, Thank Leslie, for being here this morning. <laughs> Any other announcements? Great. Well, now, in the spirit of God's extravagant welcome, I ask you to share God's peace with one another. If you're worshiping on Zoom, please share greetings of peace in the chat. And if you're worshiping here in the sanctuary, please stand and greet one another with the peace of God.
first reading today. Is this on? Yes. Okay. It's from Genesis uh, chapter 28, verses 10 through 19. Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. He came to a certain place and stayed there for a night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place. And he dreamed that there was a stairway set up on earth, the top of it reaching to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And the Lord stood beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and to your offspring. And your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and in your offspring. Know that I am with you, and will keep you wherever you go, and will bring you back to this land, for I will not have you leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob woke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob rose early in the morning, and he took the stone that he put under his head, and set it up for a pillar, and poured oil on the top of it. He called that place Bethel. The second reading is an excerpt from Conjectures of a Guilty Bystander by Thomas Merton. In Louisville, at the corner of 4th and Walnut, in the center of the shopping district, I was suddenly overwhelmed with the realization that I loved all those people, that they were mine and I theirs. That we could not be alien to one another even though we were total strangers. It was like waking from a dream of separateness, of spurious self-isolation in a special world, the world of renunciation and supposed holiness. This sense of liberation from an illusory difference was such a relief and such a joy to me that I almost laughed out loud. I have the immense joy of being human, a member of a race in which God became incarnate, as if the sorrows and stupidities of the human condition could overwhelm me. Now I realize that we are, that we all are. And if only everybody could realize this, but it cannot be explained. There is no way of telling people that they're all walking around shining like the sun. Will you please pray with me? O oh God, let me speak your words, not mine. But if I can't do that, let me speak my own words to your glory. Amen. So have you ever experienced a place or time when it seemed as though the line between the ordinary and the sacred dissolved? Have you? Show of hands, anyone? Where the presence of God became palpable? The early Celtic people believed that you could go to certain places to be closer to God. These places have long been called thin places, where a person experiences only a very thin divide between the visible world of our ordinary experiences and the presence of the sacred. These are instances where the holy is experienced by the human spirit. The Isle of Iona, which is an island off the coast of Scotland, as well as the birthplace of Celtic Christianity, has long been thought of as a thin place. Perhaps some of you have visited there. Every year, Christians make pilgrimages there to experience a deep sense of sacred presence, where the veil between the secular and the holy lifts. 
And I'm guessing that some of you have a particular place that is holy to you in a similar way. Maybe a beach you return to again and again where you're mesmerized by the waves. Or a particular forest path where you feel deep peace and the presence of the holy. Or a mountain vista where you feel close to the stars and closer to God. Or maybe even this very sanctuary, which has been a sacred haven for so many over the years. Thin places are places that awaken us to the presence of God. <clears throat> now, most of the time, we humans are not aware of or paying attention to the ways that God or the Holy Spirit or the Divine Presence, whatever name works for you, moves in and through our lives. But there are places that foster our sense of awakening to God, to the sense of the eternal amid the ordinary. And these thin places are often experienced in nature, but thin places don't have to be connected to geography. They can be experiences that come to us as well. Memories, a specific piece of music, a special story, a word spoken at just the right time, the experience of birth, of death, and our dreams. These things can also be thin places in which we experience God as very close and very real. And in our scripture passage today, Jacob's experience of a thin place comes through his fantastical dream. Now to give a little context, the heroes of the Hebrew Bible, which we also call the Old Testament, were all flawed human beings. Not a one of them was perfect, but Jacob's flaws put him near the top of the list. For Jacob was a scoundrel, a crook. He cheated his brother Esau out of the inheritance and blessing that was Esau's birthright. And not surprisingly, Esau became enraged and was out for blood. So when this scripture passage begins, Jacob is on the run. He's got himself into quite a pickle. And when nightfall came and nobody seemed to be on his trail, he decided to camp out for the night. And perhaps having left in too much a hurry to take his sleeping bag with him, he decided to tuck a stone under his head for a pillow and began to drift off. Now, if we were going to predict what would ensue, we might think that he would toss and turn all night because of his guilty conscience, or at least be tormented by troubling dreams. But that is not what happened. Instead, he slept soundly with his rock for a pillow and dreamed the kind of dreams you would have thought were reserved for the saints. For he dreamed there was a staircase reaching up to heaven with angels moving up and down it and God's voice speaking to him. But the words God spoke in the dream were not the admonition we might have expected, but something quite the opposite. God told Jacob that the land he was lying on would belong to him and his descendants, and that someday his descendants would become a great nation and a great blessing to all the other nations on earth. And as if that wasn't enough, God then added this assurance, know that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go. In the words of theologian Frederick Buechner, it wasn't holy hell that God gave him, but holy heaven. Even for a con artist like Jacob, there are a few things in this world you can't obtain 
but can only be given, like love, and particularly the love of God. And luckily for Jacob and for us, the love of God is not dependent on who we are, but exists because of who God is. Now, some of you may remember last week I preached about the parable of the sower and the description of God sowing seeds of wild abandon everywhere, regardless of the soil conditions. In both of these stories, which were written at very different times and showing up in very different places in our Bible, God's love is extended to all, to everyone, as pure gift. And it is literary, literary irony that it took a dream, a time of sleep, for Jacob to awaken to the presence of God. And I think my favorite line in the scripture passage is, surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. I don't know about you, but this seems very familiar to me as our experiences of God's presence often take us by surprise. Sometimes we seek out a holy experience, but just as often, if not more, the holy place or experience finds us often when we least expect it. Jacob's dream helps him reconnect to God and receive a blessing that benefits not only him, but the whole world. Neither the nearness of God nor Jacob's dream is for Jacob alone. God says, remember all the promises I've made to your people. I'm here with you too and you will be a blessing to all the families of the earth. This transcendent moment, this nearness of God, is not just for Jacob or his particular people, but for the whole world. And I think we often think of moments like this as deeply personal epiphanies or awakenings, as private moments when we experience something so much bigger than we are. And they are personal. But these thin place experiences also can act as deep connectors to God and to other people. For if we experience God's nearness, and at the same time know that God's love is for all, that it follows that God is just as present with everyone else as with us. And that transforms how we experience these moments. And it was certainly true for writer and Trappist monk Thomas Merton, author of our second reading today. His thin place experience at the corner of 4th and Walnut in Louisville, Kentucky, astonished him with a powerful sense of the connectedness of all humanity, of us all as glowing reflections of God's love. That experience in Louisville happened in the middle of an ordinary day when Merton was running errands for the monastery in which he lived. And when you visit that spot today, it still seems like an ordinary sort of place, unless you know the story of what happened there. Merton's revelation reflects Celtic spirituality's hallmark of the nearness of God in all things. And in that, a sense of deep connection to God, to all of creation, and to one another. Historian of American religion, Dorothy Bass, gives a lovely example of how we might cultivate more deeply these connections in our lives, as she focuses on practical ways to live a life of faith. She begins by noting how often we ask one another, how was your day? I imagine we all ask our friends and family members that question 
pretty frequently? I know I do. It's a kind of question that usually comes from someone who really cares, but is often met with a vague response like, not bad, or it was okay. In contrast, she tells the story of a mother she knows who has quite a different way of asking that question. As she tucks her children into bed each night, their teeth brushed and their hair still damp from the bathtub, she asks them this question, where did you meet God today? And they tell her one by one. A teacher helped me. There was a homeless person in the park. I saw a tree with lots of flowers on it. And she in turn tells them where she met God as well. Before the children drop off to sleep, the stuff of their day has become the substance of prayer. They enter a thin place, and the presence of God is very near. Now I have a question for us. How might our days be different if we approach them with an expectation of meeting God? If we remember that we will never look into the eyes of someone God doesn't love. If we took the time to notice, to wake up to the presence of God around us. I encourage you to try it and see what happens. For you might just find yourself in the presence of angels. Amen. I was in such a prayerful space that I forgot my laptop. <laughs> this is a time in our service for you to comment or ask questions or react to anything I might have said or anything in the service. And for you on Zoom, I have my laptop in front of me so you can put your questions or comments in the chat. Is there anyone who wants to kick this off? Dale, brave, Dale's brave, he's gonna.
So um, we've been visiting this guy at the prison for years. And he told us on Friday that the Lord had come to visit him. And the story was um, he's gotten so, his, he has Parkinson's, which is developing so rapidly that I'm going to ask for prayer for him that I don't know how many more times we'll see him before he can't come to the program anymore. But he was, he told us that he was lying in his cell at night, uh, shaking so bad and with such pain in his head that he couldn't sleep. And this had been going on for weeks. And he said, uh, I don't remember exactly his words, whether, he didn't say he saw the Lord, he said the Lord came to him. And the result of that was a, a profound sense of peace, and he stopped shaking for four hours. And when he talked to us um, the next When he talked to us the next day, he said that had led to a deep, deep sense of repentance on his part. That he spent the night telling God everything. He was sorry for everything he did. And for the first time in the seven years we visited him, he confessed that he did the crime that he had always said he was uh, set up for. <laughs> you know, like the CIA made it look like his crime, or the Satanists. He, he does struggle with mental illness, as all the men in the prison do. And I about fell on the floor, because his story has been, I didn't do it. And Friday he said, I did it. And I think his, um, whatever that experience of presence, that thin place was, uh, it at least temporarily healed him, both body and mind. So he didn't experience the Parkinson's for four hours. And somehow he got clarity about, I really did commit this crime. Mm. Um, to me, that was just stunning to have. And talk about a place you wouldn't expect. <laughs> and his crime was murder. Um, so, you know, this is one of those Jacob guys, one of those rascals. Yeah. So. Anyhow, just to affirm that this wow. kind of stuff does happen. It's powerful. He, you don't normally think of a thin place being a prison cell, but that is something, yeah. Dale. Thanks for sharing yeah. that. Wow. Anyone else? Want to share a thin place experience? I think sometimes this is hard for us as, I don't know whether it's as UCCers or as progressive uh, Christians or as people who uh, enter our faith often through our intellect and our heads to talk about these kinds of experiences that are beyond words but that are transformational. Um, yeah, so I'm hoping to cultivate in all of us and to foster in all of us a faith of the head and the heart. So uh, these kinds of sermons are important to me. Uh, I have a couple of comments from Zoom. Mark says, thanks, Jennifer, in your sermon, you described what mindfulness means to me. And then he said, unexpected. And then Daryl said, the wonderful harp music feels like a thin place surrounding us. So thank you, Leslie. I will definitely uh, add that sentiment as well. And then Peter says, divine connections are everywhere, not just in thin places, for all creatures of creation. Thanks.
Peter. I think you're right, and I think oftentimes we're, that awareness is not consciously with us. Uh, anyone else want to weigh in this morning? Complete thanks to Leslie. You know, when she first started playing this morning, there was a part of me that just said, we could scrap this worship service and just listen to the harp for an hour and come out differently. Uh, yeah, so beautiful. Well, thank you, everybody. All this we pray in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray this prayer as we speak the words most meaningful for us. Holy One, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Let us not fall into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Will you please stand as you are able and join us in our closing hymn, number 431, Go My Children With My Blessing. blessing. As we end this time of worship, go into God's world with confidence and hope, for God's presence is surely with you. Amen. Wave at our friends. Ha, 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 ha.